Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today, we are welcoming back to the show, Mr. Carl Deniger. Carl is the former CEO of MCS Net. He is an author, a finance blogger, a political activist, and one of the earliest founders of the Tea Party movement. Carl runs Market-Ticker.org, and we are thrilled to have him back today to get his perspective Perspective on everything that has been going on since he was here before. Carl, welcome back to the show. How are you today? I'm doing great. It's uh, a little bit of a rainy day today, but you know, it's a good day for an interview. <laughs> That's right. You know, Carl, the last time you were here, President Trump was under an attempted impeachment by the Democrats, and we were talking about who could be the Democratic candidate. So you were here quite a while ago and everything has changed. You know, Carl, I want to start off with the topic of inflation. Just because it is heavy on everybody's mind, we are watching lumber prices go way up. We're watching food start to rise. Gasoline prices are through the roof. And this is huge because it has a huge effect upon the supply chain. So let's start with inflation. Talk to us about where we are and where we're going. The, uh, there's, there's an old saying, uh, Friedman was... It was uh, known for it, that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. And it's, it's absolutely true. I mean, when you look at a dollar of credit, it spends exactly like a dollar of money. They, they're identical economically. If you pull out your Visa card or $20 bill, it doesn't make any difference. They, they work exactly the same way in the store. And what the government has done over the last year um, in response to uh, you know, so-called shocks of pandemics, is to essentially throw credit into the system in an unbridled and unprincipled fashion. The result of doing this is going to be inflation. It's already been inflation. You take a look at what's happened with houses and things like this. But the, the follow-on effects are especially severe because we have taken a large number of people out of the labor force who are on the lower end of the scale and have said, well, you get paid essentially $15 an hour to sit at home and smoke bongs. And so the clearing price for an hour of labor, when you get paid $15 an hour to sit around and get drunk or, or in some states get high, is going to be above that because you're now telling people, well, you, know, you want them to go back to work. Well, if you want me to actually work, you have to pay me more than I get paid to not work, right? I mean, that's, that's just logic. So you're seeing places that can't get labor now, unskilled labor for $20 an hour. Well, that's 40 grand a year. And that's before you add in all the other costs. And I, I always love people say, well, you know, the fight for 15 or whatever have you. It, it, that's not where it ends. As a former CEO, I know about what it ends up costing. And then you have Obamacare on top of it. If you're a larger employer, you have to provide that to your employees or you get fined. And so as a result... That $40,000 a year isn't 40, it's more like 50. And tell me what retail outlet or what restaurant can pay, you know, the wait staff $50,000. It, 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 you can't, I mean, that, but that's the cost. And so what you have now is businesses that were shut down. They're trying to come back online. They can't because they can't find the employees to staff the place. And, and at the same time, you have the, you've built this expectation in that the government shall provide. And uh, what ends up happening? Well, it shows up in, in places like lumber. So for, as lumber is a great example. There is no shortage of wood. There are stacks of felled trees outside the lumber mills. The reason that there is no lumber at a reasonable price is because the people who run the lumber mill are relatively unskilled labor, and they won't come back to work at the price that the lumber mill can afford to pay. And so now your, your sheet of, you know, a, a flooring OSB that goes underneath the, the hardwood floor or the carpet in your house, that sheet of plywood or OSB goes from being, a, you know, $23, $24 to $100. And it's just because there's not enough supply and there's still demand. So um, hello, welcome to uh, a very bad time. And the same thing is happening now with fuels it's happening with food. 
Uh, there's a dislocation going on right now because of this, this colonial pipeline that feeds the East Coast. If this is not fixed within a few days, you're going to have a really serious problem because when you run out of diesel fuel, you have to realize the truck that brings the food to your grocery store has to be able to get back to where it came from. It's not just, is there fuel you know, in Arkansas, it's is there fuel in Arkansas all the way into New Jersey and then back? And if the answer is no, anywhere along that line, that truck never leaves the terminal originally with the stuff because that guy's not going to drive halfway up there and then run out of fuel and have no way to put any more in the truck. That's crazy. He's not going to do it. And so this is in the colonial thing in particular, uh, this uh, how you ever had a company that performs a licensed function. And let's face it, handling gasoline is dangerous, okay? I mean, you know, gasoline has this way of going boom, and it pollutes the environment when it gets where it's not supposed to go. How did we end up with a company that performs this function that has no regulatory oversight going on, and they've got a, a piece of computer malware that gets into their systems and causes them to shut the entire thing down? That's crazy. I do computer security work. I know how to build systems that allow for remote work and don't have this kind of possibility. They obviously didn't do it. And now, oh, what are we going to have? Possibly a, a supply chain dislocation and a collapse as a result? Yeah. And we're very close to it. I mean, if anyone has watched the videos just across the states and the Carolinas where, you know, people can't get, it's not just the truckers. It's, it's lines for miles where people, miles, where people are sitting on the road up to the gas station. And will the gas station be able to accommodate them once they're there. But yeah, the truckers, um, people don't realize, you know, they're like, oh, it's a problem in North Carolina or wherever the pipeline may be. But the supply chain, the supply chain, it's so fragile once you break that and where those truckers are coming from. And, you know, the Carolinas are major food industry storage areas in our country. Well, it's yeah. And, it, and it's especially bad because I, I know people in the trucking industry they are they have already essentially shut down all the LTL that's less than full load. So less than a full trailer that has essentially been stopped for the entire East Coast of the United States at this point, because they have no assurances that they're going to be able to get back from where they take the load. And if you can't do that, they're not going to take the load. And that's, that's the beginning and the end of the conversation. And, you know, you have to realize those trucks they get, you know, nine, 10 miles a gallon. Okay. That's it. And I got a big tank. And if you can't put diesel in it to get back to where you need to. It's just, it's a, it's a very scary thing. I want to change the subject right now, just a bit to what we're going to call C-19 and hope we get not in trouble. <laughs> um, I want to know how much of the overall economic situation you attribute to C-19? Or do you believe that it was just the trigger point to something that was already coming? You know, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, I, I would say that the event itself is not only not unprecedented, um, but it is extraordinarily common. We have the various epidemic and pandemic flus that go around. They always have. Uh, there was a very bad one in the late 1800s that was shortly after the Long Depression in 1873. I, I'm aware of it because I, I do a lot of economic research. It was one of the I didn't talk about that specifically in leverage in my book, but I did talk a lot about 1873 and, and what set that off, which was just outrageous speculation, primarily centered around railroad expansion. Uh, of course, we all know about the, pan the, the swine flu pandemic 1918. Most of the people who that killed were actually killed by secondary bacterial infections, not by the flu itself. And so it was just, you know, we didn't have the medical knowledge. There were no antibiotics. So if you got a bacterial infection, you either fought it off or it killed you. And that was it. We didn't have anything we could do for you. Um, and so, but what we've done here is taken a situation that, that, had some potential to be very bad, and we made it 100 times worse, and we did it with our economic policies. This was not so much about uh, you know, mitigating what was going to happen to people as a result of a disease. So if you look at Sweden, which did almost none of this by force, they had a curve that looks almost identical to ours. 
And we essentially shut our economy down. And even today, there are parts of it that remain shut down. And then we turned on the credit spigot and started handing out free cash to essentially anybody who wanted it. That had nothing to do with the disease. That had to do with our reaction to it. And so, you know, I don't know whether or not this was all part of somebody's, you know, evil genius plan to destroy America before this thing came around. It sure looks like it. I tell you, I don't mean to well, interrupt, you know, but it sure looks pre-planned to me. You know, I, I have this I have this saying that I, I'm very fond of, which is never attribute to malice that which is av- adequately explained by stupidity. Mm. And when you have a population that and, and this is very sad because it goes back to the 1990s and 95 percent of the people that came in for a job at my company in, and about half of them were actually enrolled in college. These were young people who were just trying to make some money to, you know, to add to their thing or pay their way through school, whatever have you. Half of those people that were in college and 95 percent who applied could not do four function arithmetic with a paper and pencil and write a basic business letter in English. And, and I started keeping the tests in a lateral file because I was very concerned that eventually the EEO was going to call, you know, show up and start claiming that I was discriminating against this person or that person or you know, whatever have you. So I kept the records and I have a file full of these tests. You wanted an interview, you had to go in the conference room and you know, here it is, here's a basic, because every one of those people could at some point be called upon if somebody came in. It was a relatively small office. We had 30, 35 people working there. Uh, someone comes in and, and their service is off because they didn't pay their bill and they've got some money in their hand. And they want their service back on. Well, you better be able to make change out of the petty cash box. And that's, I mean, everybody that was there had to be capable of doing that little piece of the job. I, uh, you know, I just have a very difficult time wrapping my mind around the possibility that this could just been massive worldwide stupidity. You know what I mean? I think that's where I go with this, you know, oh, Michelle, you're such a conspiracy theorist, theorist, you know, it's because I just can't believe that people would be or could be so stupid, but I could be wrong, you know? <laughs> well, think, think about this. The basic, one of the basic things you have to be able to do is an, as a processing and functioning adult is do basic probability right, in your head. If you have something that's one in a million possible. And another thing that's one in a million possible, the odds of both those things happening is one in a trillion. Okay. Um, that is less than one chance in, you know, one in a thousand chance across the entire population of the planet. So it's more likely that you're going to be hit by an asteroid as you're going to get your mail than that thing is going to occur. And yet we have all these things that we're told, oh, they're just coincidences. They're just, you know, this just happened. Well, it's a coincidence. It's not connected. Well, look, if you tell me that something has a one in a million chance of going bad, and then I have this other thing that could happen to me um, just from walking around every day, and that has a one in a hundred thousand chance of happening to me today, and I do the one thing, and then the other one happens, what is the probability that that's a random chance? It wasn't caused. You know, I mean... There's so many points in this. There's just so many points in this. But you know, you know what the the overriding point to me is, Carl. You know, I just I have a very difficult time believing in all of these coincidences. I just really do. I mean, the 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 six major things that happened during you know President Trump's presidency, the the whole march. You know, we're gonna burn up in ten years because of the Green Deal. You know, CO two is gonna burn us up. This was like three years ago. Now we're seven years out, apparently, from the planet burning up and no one says a word. I mean, all of this stuff is so and this was worldwide marching in the streets, you know, not just the United States, but Europe and the UK. And, you know, everyone was just terrified. And the the trigger to terrify, apparently, everyone and make them completely overreact is very, very small. Well, it it is. But, you know, the the global warming thing is always amusing to me because one of the things we were told was that the sea level was going to rise by five feet and by 2100. We were told this in in 2000. Well, in 2000, I bought a house in Florida on the water and I put a dock in. 
Um, as a result, I know exactly where the water level was at high and low tide. It has a re- relatively low tidal range there. And 20 years later, when I sold the house last year, uh, the, the water level was in, uh, within my ability to determine exactly the same place. Well, guess what? <laughs> That was 20 years. So if it was supposed to go up by five feet in 20 years, it would go by one foot, right? Because, you know, 20 is a fifth of 100. Well, how come the water line isn't up by a foot? Because it's not. <laughs> it's This is just all like people making it up. You know, you could take, I, I don't know, the example of like a first grader making something up, you know, and then everybody has to wear masks because, you know, it's a, it's a million percent and then we're going to shut everything down. And you look at that kid and say, you know what, an idiot. But the whole world did this based on what I believe to be the flu. Um, it happens every single year. And it's just very, very strange. You know, I want to shift into um, because we have you here and because you're so financially Brilliant. I want to go into investing right now, Carl. And I want to start with cryptos. And that's probably not, <laughs> not your favorite. <laughs> not, not, not the most intellectually stellar position to start with. But what are your thoughts? I want you to share with everybody. And do you even consider them to be an investment at all? No, they're not. They're, they're tulip bulbs. <laughs> <laughs> and, and actually, they're they're less than tulip bulbs because at least tulip bulbs are pretty. <laughs> so, uh, one of the things that I always that I find so fascinating about the entire crypto craze is that so many of the people that are cranked up about it are the millennials. They're the younger generation that are listening to the Greta Thunbergs and and how the entire world is going to burn up and we're all going to die because it's going to get hotter. Well, um, excuse me, don't you use an awful lot of electricity? And and what <laughs> happens to electricity when it goes in a computer? It comes and, and believe me, as a guy who used to have to pay this bill, Every dollar you spend for power to run a computer, you get to pay for again because you have to run an air conditioner to get the heat out of the room. <laughs> and so, you know, I, mean, I, I had some very large and expensive air conditioners in my data center for that exact reason. And, if, and we had them fail a couple of times and it was a five alarm emergency and the possibility that everything we had in the room would overheat and burn up. Mm. The idea that you have people doing this for no productive purpose whatsoever making the planet hotter. And this is, we're supposed to all be about to die because the planet's getting hotter. There is just a certain level of insanity that comes to mind when you take those two things and put them together. (laughs) Right, right. Just so everybody knows, we're not getting hotter. The, the, The planet's not going to burn up. Our earth goes through this and she's done it for three billion years and she'll continue to do it. And there's going to be times when human life is unsustainable upon this planet. And there's going to be times that it flourishes and it has really nothing to do with what we do to it, except for, and I will bring this up, our garbage, our pollution that we put into the ocean, that we put into the land. You know, we, instead of, you know, talking about, oh, the CO2, this and the CO2, CO2 is plant food. You know, there was a huge amount of CO2, you know, um, back in the days of dinosaurs and back in the days of creation of the planet because of uh, volcanic activity. It spewed fossil fuel into the atmosphere and humans could not breathe at that time, but it didn't kill the earth. It made the earth plentiful in terms of vegetation. But my point to this is that Humans are affecting the earth in terms of, Carl, the whole sea is full. The bottom of it is full of microplastics. So then you, what know where, you know where all that's coming you know where all that's coming from on a percentage basis? Talk to us about your perspective. So we in the United States went through a period of time where we didn't care much about the environment, Love Canal. Uh, I lived near the Detroit river for a while. You couldn't swim in it. It was toxic. Uh, if you caught fish out of it, you would be advised not to eat them. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Because while the fish were surviving, uh, they, you know, like any other organism, they accumulate whatever they take in. Right. So there was, there was bioaccumulation of very dangerous chemicals. Uh, if you drove around in downriver Detroit, your eyes would water from the chemicals being spewed out of the plants into the air. We got tired of that. And with good cause, we cleaned it up 
And we decided we're not going to do that anymore. So now if you want to produce chemicals, you want to make nasty things, you have to properly neutralize them or recycle them or do it, something other than dump them into the environment. Well, guess what? It's too expensive to do that and make the products that you want to buy on Amazon and at Walmart and everywhere else. So what did they do? They put all the manufacturing and all of that stuff over in China and India and other parts of the world where they dump it all in the middle of the road. Most of the plastic that comes that is in the oceans is coming from those, e those Eastern nations, the ones that we think are so critical, where we produce 90% of the precursors and in many cases, the finished products that are our pharmaceuticals. We are inextricably tied to India and China for these things, and yet they pollute like crazy. You, you, in India, a substantial percentage of the population literally defecates in the street, and another significant percentage defecates into the rivers directly, untreated. This is a common thing in parts of the world. There are huge parts of the planet where there is no power. Half of sub-Saharan Africa does not have reliable electricity in the home. So we want to talk about what's going on. Well, guess what? Why are we sourcing? Why do we allow a company like Nike to be listed on our stock exchange and sell shoes in our market? Why do we allow Apple to make phones with chips and other materials that are made and assembled in China when that's what they do over there? And the whole reason that we're doing that production in those countries is because it's cheaper. Well, it's always cheaper to throw your trash on the street than to recycle it. It's just so mind blowing to me that all of these people, these politicians and these you know, lobbyists and everything, you know, oh, CO2 this and CO2 that and the Green New Deal. And the, while we are killing our our oceans. We are killing our oceans with this plastic and this pollution and this toxic dumping and waste. And I don't mean to go off on it, but it just, Carl, it blows my mind that they can have millions of people marching for an imaginary cause, this CO2, when in fact, it's, it's huge knowledge that our oceans are in desperate, dire, crying need. We're killing our sea creatures. And it's because, oh, nobody sees it. It's below the, you know, the, the water. The people that are doing this know very well what they're doing, and they are not called out. And well, of, I course, well, of, course, oh, of course they do. But, you know, let's even, let's even back up a bit on CO2. The United States today emits about the same amount of carbon dioxide as it did in 1982, 1983. And the reason is because of economics. Natural gas contains more energy per dollar of sp spent on the fuel than does coal. And so it is very simple. I'll use natural gas. And the reason is because it's CH4 chemically. Hydrogen has a, the hydrogen bonds have a great deal of energy in them. When you burn it, you release that energy. You get that out and you can do something useful with it, like power a power plant. Coal is just C, carbon, has less energy. And so as a result, we shifted a lot of our fuel consumption from coal to natural gas. And we didn't do it because we we're trying to be clean. We did it because it was cheaper. So that, you know, when I was growing up, we had an oil fired furnace. And in the middle of the 1980s, we swapped off for a natural gas one because the pipe came down along the road and all we had to do was pay for the little piece of stub that goes to the house from the road. Okay, well, guess what? We spent the money to change out that furnace, not because we, we wanted to be green in the environment. It was because it cost half as much to run for the winter time as using the oil. And since the pipe was right there, we used it. Well, that's, that's what progress does. But China, on the other hand, now produces is, is their CO2 emissions are exploding higher. And are we doing anything about this? No, we're not. Because, well, if, you know, we didn't let them do that, you couldn't have those Nikes. You couldn't have that nice stock price for Apple. You wouldn't have Amazon with all these products that are coming from overseas. Same thing with Walmart, same with all the other multinational corporations. It's not just them. You call all the semiconductors that are made over there. We have a problem right now with semiconductor shortages. They are the TSMC is having a terrible problem with production. And oh boy, gee, where's that? That's Taiwan. 
Well, isn't there this little geopolitical thing going on right now between China and Taiwan? I think there is. So why didn't we, you know, Trump was, he was going to fix all of this. Well, how much of it actually got brought back to the United States? Zero. Yeah, it's real interesting when you look at the reality of like, like 10 of the points you just made. But just in in closing this, I mean, all the points that you just made are so huge. What they are focusing on right now is this Green New Deal, which is coming. The reason I'm bringing this up and how fake this is and where we really should, everyone really should be looking at our oceans, just as humans that care about the planet Earth herself, you know, and the progress that you just mentioned that we could be making if we had inventions that made it, you know, biodegradable plastics from hemp, you know, I mean, there are so many things that could be happening to make a whole lot of money and save the planet Earth that are just, who cares? Because we have this Green New Deal about the CO2, and now we're going into money printing, Carl. You know, it's- Yeah, but I, you know, that's, that, that's the thing, is it's all, it's all about how do, how do I keep the stock market up? How do I shift things? How do I keep people's eye off the ball? Okay, mm-hmm. if, you want jo- if you want good jobs, if you want people to have to work, then you have to cut down the inflation tree because if you don't, it doesn't, you know, it does not matter how many dollars you have. What matters is what they buy. And if you connect yourself to people who are not your friends, and I, I don't care what anybody tries to tell me, China is not our friend. If they can find some way to hose us, they will do it. That is their goal. And that we have people on both sides of the aisle in our government who are willing to sit there and say, oh, well, you know, this is all just fine. We'll all just have all these solar panels. Well, guess what? Building solar panels is a nice idea. However, it requires a lot of toxic chemicals. And what do you do with those toxic chemicals? Well, why do you think they build them in China? Because they dump them on the ground. (laughs) I mean, you know, folks, the reality of it is we we don't use internal combustion engines in cars because we're pigs. We use it because nobody's figured out how to get how any other way to get 110,000 BTUs of energy in a one gallon can that weighs six pounds. And all that we they need to do, not, I'm just going to interject, all we need to do is use our own creativity, invent something that'll make it cheaper for everyone. As you said, if it's cheaper, they'll go for it. But, you know, and, and make it green, period. That it's, it's a very simple solution, but no one seems to be able to see that solution. All they can see is that now we're about to have the big proposal under Biden for the Green New Deal that's going to cost how many trillion? Oh, by the way, everybody, you know, do you realize that we spent um, almost, and I know you do, almost five trillion as our total year in 2020, and we've already, he's already printed 10 trillion dollars and he's just not even getting started yet our money is burning burning well trump was responsible for just as much of that over the last year before he left office so i I, you have to be a little careful there because i don't think you're going to find your savior in the republican party they're i'm not saying that the republican party but i'm saying carl what how okay how shall i say this we have printed so many trillions of dollars in the past, what, how many years? Oh, well, you go back and you look at what happened after the crash in 08. I mean, that was insanity. And then, but it all goes back. It's, it started after the 2000 tech wreck when it was decided that the people who caused it that were the, I mean, I, I would argue that 90% of the companies that were set up during that time in the, in the dot-com uh, you know, terror, if you will, that was everybody's wonder until it blew up. 90% of those firms were abject frauds, and every one of those people should have gone to prison along with all the bankers that listed them and put them out there as IPOs. Not one person went to jail. Well, they tried to put Bernie Evers in jail, but he died first. It was, you know, it was an unfortunate reality that uh, he never got to serve his sentence. But the, um, and then in 07 and 08, you look at what happened, how many people went to prison? And yet during the SNL crisis, which was another bank finance debacle, there were thousands of financiers that ended up in jail, which is exactly where they deserved to be. But boy, oh boy, after that, we didn't do it anymore. And we're not doing it now. And so as a result, the answer to everything that comes along is throw credit at the problem. It's not money printing, it's credit printing. Your money is backed by something useful. 
You cannot print money. You can't create money. You can create credit all you want. But at the end of the day, if there's nothing productive behind it, you end up with a spiral. And we're seeing the start of it now between way and, and the worst part of inflation, the absolute worst kind is wage push. And that's what you're seeing It is very hard to stop it because the only way to stop it impoverishes people at the lower end of the economic strata, or you have to cut off the people that are running these large companies and making billions and billions of dollars doing it by screwing people and screwing the environment. You have to cut them off at the knees. And until we do that as, as a people, and it's, and it's going to have to be a tremendous pushback on the politicians on both sides. There is no answer to this that doesn't become more destructive over time. I don't think that that we as a people, whether we're rep, you know Republicans or Democrats, Greens or Libertarians, it, you know, I don't think we have not only the mental unity. I don't think we have the education base that people would need to realize what's happening or the result of what's being put into place. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I th- what are your thoughts? Where do you think we're going with this, Carl? Well, I think that uh, I think you're right. And, and like I said, back in the 1990s, uh, you know, it's the majority of the people came in and tried to get a job from me could not make change for 20. All right. Well, how do you expect people to have any kind of economic literacy if they can't do basic mathematics? We're not talking about calculus here. <laughs> okay. these, these are people who are, are adults and, and literally, if the cash register stops working in the gas station, they can't make change to sell you a map. They literally can't do it. And, and this, is, this is what we have as a base. We've, we've allowed this. As a nation, we have allowed this to go on. We put men on the moon using nothing other than slide rules and pieces of paper to do their design with. There were no computers. We had to invent a computer capable of making the course calculations because it didn't exist prior to Apollo. That machine today has less power by the fact of 100 than the little microprocessor that's in your microwave oven. And yet we, we had we put men on the moon doing this. Okay, using nothing other than slide rules and pieces of paper to do their designs. And it worked, didn't it? Because, (laughs) you know, there you are. The Saturn V is real. It really did fly. We didn't really come that much further forward when we built the shuttles. I mean, you'd think so, but no, not really. I mean, the the flight control computers and those things were ancient by today's technology standards. And so we look at, at, you know, you look at the look at the airplanes, look at uh, Boeing. How how many, you know, 707. What, what did you build that with? A piece of paper, a pencil, and a slide rule. <laughs> right? I mean, you know, that's all we had. And yet we sent people to college. They came out and they were able to do this kind of thing. Today, you, you got kids going into college that literally can't make change for a $20 bill. And that's, and that's the world we live in. So that's the base of knowledge and understanding that you have among the public. And, and whether you like it or not, that's what we're dealing with. So I don't know how this ends in a way that's productive because you can have – Somebody from Capitol Hill, I don't care who it is, if they got a white lab coat on or they're, you know, they're, they're a senator or a representative, whatever have you, they get up in front of the microphone and they say something and it can be complete garbage. And one person in 100 has enough firepower going on upstairs to actually recognize right on the spot that it's just a flat out lie. I mean, we just saw that yesterday in Senate testimony, someone who will not be named, flat out lied that a particular kind of research was being done and was paid for by the United States federal government. The people who did the research published the results on a public website that is still up there and references the exact grant number that came from that agency that this guy runs. He lied directly to the Senate. And and to keep us safe, you need to look up um, Rand Paul from yesterday. And yeah. that, I think that'll keep this, you know, for the interview of, of, of uh, the non said name, because, wow, that was extraordinary to watch, Carl. I mean, the fact that that just even happened. And you know what the shame of it is? It just seems like there's no, how should we say this? There's no adults in the room. It seems like a bunch of little kids are running around 
Oh, be afraid of that. Oh, there's a big bear over there. Oh, it's a stick over there. Everybody hide. Oh, it's just stupid. It's just a stupidity. Uh, when someone sits up there and full out lies, no one, no one says, we have the tape. Let's refer to it. No well, one says the thing is, it's, anything. Yeah, but it's greed. When you get down to it, 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 it it's just simple. It's greed. It's just money. Uh, you know, you have you have billions of dollars that are flowing through these federal agencies, all of them, not just one or two. They're all over the place. OK, and and you have all of these these different lobbyists. You know, uh, come on. Jeff Bezos bought The Washington Post for crying out loud, <laughs> you know, so he could spew whatever he wants on his news page. And, you know, oh, well, it's going to be independent, but I own it. Well, how, how many critical things do you think that that newspaper is going to write about the working conditions in his warehouses? Yeah, Man, nothing about Amazon is going to go up there for sure. Um, you know, it, it's just such an interesting thing, you know, and we can do our interviews and, and everyone who's listening, you know, you know, thinks this and, and says that has interesting commentary. But what we have between all of us, the circle, our audience, yourself and myself is a situation where it just seems like the entire world has been, um, I, I, I get, I get Pied Piper in my head. I get, you know, like everyone blindly following whatever's being said. And then honestly, if you start to diverge or you say anything against it, you get so viciously um, ridiculed. You know, you really have to be tough to say what you see. And it surprises me that I see something completely different than almost everybody else on the planet, not yourself, but you know what I'm saying? Like, how can everybody look at this and see this when I see that, you know, you know, Michelle, I don't, I don't know. I don't know really how, how true that is. And I, and I, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, I, I live in what would be considered a rather redneck area. I sort of like it too, that way. Yeah. (laughs) Um, and, and there's, certain things that people have been being told to do. And it seems that only about a quarter of the people here have decided to do them. And so you got to wonder, is the other three quarters not doing it because they may not be willing to say it because they know what the consequences will be if they speak up, but the answer is still no. (laughs) And so I, you know, I think, I think there is the last year in particular, and the small business people, the people who are out there on the street, nobody wants to, you know, everyone says, oh, there's no real inflation. There's no inflation. There's no inflation. Well, I went to the pub last week and the only thing being talked about in there among everybody that was there uh, over their beer was how much inflation there was in the local economy and how badly everyone was getting screwed. And, and it centered around two things. One was the cost of goods and services, including silly things like, oh, I might want to put a new deck on my house because my dad, you know, the boards are rotting. I go to the lumber yard to go get the wood and, um, <laughs> you know, hey, what happened? And then you got the other one, which is there's help wanted signs up everywhere and Oh, well, you know, why don't I just sit at home and, uh, and get wasted yeah. for, you know, $600 a week? That's uh, my final point that I wanted to talk to you about. You know, um, you know, something happened to me yesterday. I was in line at a drugstore, right? It didn't really happen to me. It's just I, I, I eavesdropped. Uh, the two guys in front of me were like, um, you know, hey, you know, they wanted to bring me back. I said, no, apparently he had gotten laid off. I don't know the full story, but he was like, ah, oh, man, you know, I make home. I make more sitting at home, you know, no, 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 no. You know, my daughter, she doesn't have to go anywhere. I don't have to pay for babysitting or anything. I'm not going back to that. And the other guy next to him was like, yeah, we're getting, a, we're getting another check coming out, man. This is going to be a monthly thing. This is going to be, a, this is going to be so stoked. I'm, you know, they were like, so and I know that this is the majority of people like looking forward to not having to go to work. Well, these are waitresses and truck drivers and your clerk at your grocery store and everybody that loads the warehouses for the food. And, you know, the, the list goes on and on. These are the people that keep our society going and societies are very hard to build and very easy to take down. And this leads into the UBI. And this is just something I heard, you know, this is just a passing, maybe like oh, uh, less than a oh, minute. 
I have a niece that she, she works at one of the major big box places. I won't name it. Um, but her job is to take the food that comes in and put it on the shelf. Okay. That's her job is to make sure that the food that is in the back that comes off that truck actually ends up where you can buy it without her there isn't any food to buy, okay, because it's all in the truck. All right, so during the entire last year, she, of course, has had to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and get her butt to work and go do her job. And she's, you know, okay. And for a while, she was getting a lot of overtime, which, of course, you know, when you're getting paid time and a half, you don't complain about that, right? She thought that was great. Well, that went away. But now, She's got this little problem with her attitude, and that is that all of the people who live in her immediate vicinity, when she goes out and gets in her car at five o'clock in the morning, go to work because she has to stock those shelves. There's bong smoke rolling out of the windows of all of the other homes and apartments near her because those people didn't have to go to work because they're getting paid to not. And so they're sitting around and it's five in the morning and they're still partying from last night. Mm -hmm. And um, so what does that do to her willingness to be the cog in the wheel and make sure that you can get something to eat. It's a huge domino effect. It is a domino effect. It's going to, it's starting right now, very small, but you, you talk about, Oh, $2,000 now for the UBI. And that could become a monthly thing. And we're printing trillions and trillions of dollars. Who's going to go to work. And then when people stop going to work and all of those little businesses close and the government comes in and starts to own everything and then robotics start to take over. So these big AI companies start to, you know, whatever. I mean, where do you see this going? Um, Michelle, if, if they actually are stupid enough to attempt that, then they might be. I think they are. Well, <laughs> I, I, I don't. We're talking I, about robotics. You know, I, I understand. But the thing is this. You really can't get there audience. from here. And I know people think that, you know, robotics and that, that, that. I, I, I've done this sort of work for an awfully long time. I write code. I have part of my job over the years has been integrating software with hardware. That is what a robotics thing does, right? You take a computer and it drives a piece of hardware that does a specific thing. Okay. Well, I, I used to write that software for a living. And, and if you watched cable TV during the 1980s and 1990s, your, your signal went through, almost certainly went through a piece of equipment that I wrote the software to make it work. <laughs> okay. So I, I'm, I'm not new to this sort of thing, but I, I will say this, anyone that thinks that they're going to get away with that and then turn around and just turn around, print credit and hand it out to people to sit around and get drunk all day. You got another thing coming. The supply chain is going to break. And when it does, there isn't going to be any gas. There isn't going to be any food. And the big problem is if you think it ends there, you, you turn on the water tap in your house. The only reason you can drink the water is that a truck brought a load of sanitizing chemicals to the water plant. Without that, the water you have is not consumable by humans. Wow. Be careful where you go with stuff like oh, this because it wow. can collapse really fast. Oh, that is just a comp. That is real. I'm really upset that you even put that in my mind. <laughs> rea- reality is somewhat of a problem. I mean, you've got the same sort of thing with power plants. Oh, there's a generator over here. Bearings going bad in it. We have to turn it off. Put a new bearing in it. Uh, there aren't any bearings. Oops. You didn't want the power to work when you turned the switch on, did you? Robotics can't fix that. So it's just such it's it's. I hate so to be so negative. Connected. It's just that people have to understand and people have to start thinking, you know, think about it, think about it. But that's not going to change anything for the 80 percent of the people that are going to get UBI that aren't going to go to work, you know, and they're not going to come back to work. You, t- you mentioned the restaurant workers that they couldn't get the restaurant workers. It's like. I don't, I don't think the UBI thing will happen, and I'll, and I'll tell you why. Oh, good. I think what you've seen is, this, is the small-scale part of it over the last few months, okay, as, as places have reopened and the help want signs all go up, but the jobs don't get filled, 
Okay. And so somebody is going to notice that, um, wait a minute, if we do this and the truck doesn't come into the city tomorrow because there's no truck driver, because he can sit at home, just like the guy in the grocery store. Okay. Then there's no water because the sanitizing chemicals aren't there and the plant doesn't run. And then, oh, by the way, um, the, the fuel jet for the generator that makes your electricity, um, you know, that needs to be replaced, but there aren't, any, that was supposed to be on that truck too. And that truck didn't show up either. <laughs> okay. And so now you're, now your lights don't work either. And, and it doesn't take very long for this to sink into people's consciousness. And I think there has been at the top, at the, at the people that make these policy decisions, I think they've, they've seen enough at this point that they realize that there is a point at which you're pushing on a string. And once you destroy the work ethic, not just, to, you know, you do it at the people that worked at McDonald's. Okay, they'll mechanize everything. There'll be, you know, three people that, that put the food in the bags and everything else will be a robot, right? And robotics. It's like, I don't want to. Yeah, and, that, and, and that'll work at McDonald's, but it isn't going to work at the water plant. <laughs> okay. What an interesting. Oh, my gosh. And the trash people, Carl. Yeah. Well, that's a, well, that's the thing. I mean, you know, here. Yeah. Where I, really I live, going there. Oh, where, I, where I live, we have, we, have, yeah, we have these convenience stations where we, we can take our own trash or we can pay to have a, you know, have the guy come around and, you know, and, and empty your thing. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the dump is half a mile from my house. It's much easier for me to just go over there and have it picked up. And then, you know, it's a, it's a pickup location. Basically, it's not the, the actual landfill. Right. But here's the thing in the city. Well, it doesn't work that way. No, there's you got a you got a sanitation truck that comes around once or twice a week and it. What happens when those guys decide they'd rather sit at home and get drunk? <laughs> this is a crazy conversation, but it's so real. It's starting when you can't get the restaurant workers back. And, and the guy ahead of me at the drugstore, I don't know where it was, but he's not going back to work and neither is the other guy. And it's, and everybody's talking about, everybody's like, where's our check? Where's the check? Okay. UBI, UBI, UBI. <laughs> Michelle, it's not going to, I'll tell you, it's not going to happen. I know there's, okay, that, good. <laughs> the, the AOCs of the world would love to tell you it's coming and they'd love to push it to Bernie, even, but even Bernie Sanders has started to back away from this. And some of the things he said lately lead me to believe that he's kind of figured it out that, you know, it's kind of nice when, when he's got his little swanky digs going on there and he goes and he pushes the button on the wall and the lights come on and he'd like it to continue <laughs> to be that way. It's kind of nice. <laughs> Right. I mean, we, we, uh, well, this is very, we got to continue this conversation because I mean, I believe this year is going to tell the tale of this because I, I think from an, from an investment standpoint, what I would say is, is think about this as 1977 or 1978, right? You know, Jimmy Carter, right. And, and Carter got the blame for what Nixon did. Carter was not actually responsible for the high inflation that happened during his presidency. Carter, Carter was on the back end of it. Nixon was the one that was responsible for it. Carter got blamed. And then, of course, Ford, you know, he lost, right, he, he, after Nixon resigned. But the reality of it was that it was Nixon's pressure on the Federal Reserve and the Federal Reserve's repression in the 1950s and 1960s that led to what happened. The oil embargo was obviously part of it, but it was not the whole story. And what we have now is the blowback. And people are, hey, you got to love being Joe Biden and Kamala Harris because they're going to get the blame for it. But the truth of the matter is that Trump was responsible for most of what's coming. And, and Trump himself said shortly after he was elected, well, I'm the king of debt. I love debt. <laughs> yeah, look at his history over the years with all the real estate projects he did. How many, how many you know, things blew up on his face because he took up too much leverage? He nearly got destroyed by it in the 1980s. But there is, a, there is an opportunity that will come out of this because rates will rise. And when they do, if you bought a long bond, a 30-year bond in the early 1980s, you could get one that paid 15%. Think about how you would have liked to have clipped that 15% coupon for the next 30 years. It can't be called because those kinds of opportunities are going to come again. Keep your powder dry. Oh, so the investment opportunity is because of high interest rates is what you're speaking of. Yeah, but just be careful. You don't want to be in any company that has any kind of leverage on a balance sheet. And you don't want to be in a services subscription model company either because they're not going to be able to raise prices into that sort of a situation. When people run out of cash, 
You know, I, I remember sitting in line for gasoline. You could only buy five gallons or five dollars. It depended on which place you went. But there were there were limits on the pumps. And then you had to go back out and get back in line again. OK. And I also remember as a as a kid growing up in a middle aged household, we could not afford to have another uh, frozen can of orange juice concentrate. And I like to drink it. I, and we essentially ended up. I ended up being rationed as a kid because we could not afford to have more than that. My father was a CPA. We're not talking about somebody who was screwing cars together here. Carl, what do you think of precious metals right now? I don't mean to switch, but I'm really not switching. I'm, I'm wondering. What's no, it's the in the same. Yeah, people? yeah, you're in the same in the same category. Okay. Um, so precious metals have never been a very good inflation hedge when you look at the data. They have always been a good geopolitical risk hedge. So if you think there's a big war coming, and there might be, because this historically has been how nations get out of this kind of box, um, then uh, you know that might not be so bad. But I, I look at, for example, I look at gold and where it is today, and I look at where it was 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. When we were going, in, you know, during, during the time of very high oil prices, when precious metals started to take off, and yet now you've got an inflationary impulse and the price of metals doesn't seem to be going up very much, does it? Hmm. So, I, you know, I, I'm real careful there because I don't, while gold will always be usable, and so silver, silver is actually more useful than gold because from an industrial perspective, silver is used in all sorts of things. Gold is primarily a plating material for electrical contacts. So it's, it's very important in, in electronics manufacturing. But in terms of as a monetary metal, never again. And, and it's not because somebody wants it to be that way or doesn't want it to be that way. It's just, it's, it's never going to happen again. Um, as a speculative instrument, I don't particularly care for it. I, I think right now you have you have valuations that are very very high. Uh, there's been you know some corrective activity in the last you know weeks uh, within certain areas of the market, but when rates go up and they will because they're going to have to. The alternative is that the, this high inflation becomes sticky and cannot be stopped. And if that happens, then there isn't anywhere for the ordinary person to hide. You can't, you can't put enough of your money into the stock market on a percentage basis after you pay your living expenses to so stay ahead of an inflationary impulse. You can try, but you will fail. And so the only way to, that you can possibly succeed at that is to take leverage on. And then if you're wrong on timing, you're bankrupt. So I, I think the best alternative here is keep your powder dry Look at those things that are, are going to at least reasonably hold value among industrial areas where you have companies that produce things that people are going to need, no matter how bad the economy gets. <laughs> They're not going to go away. And, and just accept that there may be purchasing power lost there, and it might even be pretty significant, but at least it won't go to zero. And it, you know, if, if you want to have metals as part of that, fine, but I don't think you're going to see much appreciation there, either in real terms or in nominal terms. I just don't see it happening. Hmm. I, my suspicion is, is that this, this impulse is probably going to be about the same as it was in the late 70s and early 80s. It'll probably go on for a couple of years, but I don't think the Fed is going to be able to sit on a 4% CPI and climbing rapidly, and not just in food and energy, where they try to say, oh, it's always transitory, it's going to stop. Uh, no, it's showing up absolutely everywhere. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, we, we think the house price is going up is great. Is it really? Think about it. If you sell your bubble house, you paid $250,000 for it, now you get five. Okay, where are you going to live? The only way you win at that game is if you die. Well, then your heirs get a nice profit off the deal, but you can't make any <laughs> profit on it. You sell one bubble house, you got to buy another bubble house. Where are you going to live? When you say keep your powder dry, explain that term for everyone, please. You want your investable capital where it's, where it's not going to be lost. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, one of the places that has historically worked out really well um, is, is residential real estate as a rental, okay, if you pick your markets correctly, because the cap rate is pretty aggressive. As long as you don't try to reconvert back into other than rental property, you get very favorable depreciation treatment on taxes. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of things to look at there. 
The problem is that you have to be careful where you do it. You always have, because in some places, it's almost impossible to get a deadbeat out of your property if they don't pay you. And then what happened over the last year with this rental forbearance it essentially is, has, I mean, now you're rolling the dice on somebody just saying, you know, bite me and you can't throw them out. So there are a lot of people, that, oh, that's not really a problem. Well, yes, it is. And the reason it's a problem is go try to find rental property now that you can actually rent at a reasonable cost. Okay. In a lot of areas around here, it's almost impossible to find reasonably priced rentals. Well, okay. So where do people, you said you wanted all these people at the, on the lower income area, you know, restaurant folks and stuff like this to work. Where are they going to live? I mean, this is, you know, there's a dislocation coming both there and in commercial real estate with all the office buildings and things that were overbuilt, the malls and all of this. I don't know how ugly that's going to get, but I, I don't think that's a safe place to hide. I would, I would say, frankly, I, you know, yeah, you lose some purchasing power and cash, but there are things you can buy um, that, that you have to look at what, what kind of a nut do you have? What's the depletion rate on it? You know, the common, the common logic is you've got $500,000. You can't possibly stop working on that and live on it because, you know, if you burn up 50 a year, well, guess what? You know, in 10 years is gone, right? Well, no, that's not true because if you have 500, but you can pull three, two or 3% in, say, untaxed municipal bond interest out of it, now your depletion rate is how much? It's not 50, now it's 25. All right. And so, and the whole, so the whole game is how do you, how do you keep enough powder around that when you get to the end of this, when you see the cycle start to turn, that you can jump back in because that's when the valuations are going to be attractive right now. They're not, but down the road, they will be, and they'll be quite attractive. I think you're going to see a major correction in stock prices. And I think, and, and when rates go up, I think you're going to have an opportunity to buy longer dated debt. At, from high quality, you know, from the United States government that you will be very happy to own for the next 20 or 30 years. The, th the problem with it is you have to have the cash to do it. I mean, the last time it happened, I was just getting started as an adult. I had no money. I would have loved to have bought a 30-year bond and, and sat on the 15%, but I, I didn't have the money to do it with. So that the, you know, the opportunity comes, you either have the cash or you don't. You have the capital, you don't have it. Well, I didn't have it. So that, you know, so I missed out. That's the way it goes. Um, but I think that opportunity is going to come again. And the people who say that it's not, what they're basically betting on is that the entire federal government, everything that we know, everything that we believe in, it's all gone. And if that happens, I don't care what you're investing in. It makes absolutely no difference. <laughs> if it's gone, you know, we're not, it's pretty much. Well, well if it's gone, it, you know, <laughs> you, you want guns, but you're not going to be able to use them for very long because you're going to end up dead just like everybody else. <laughs> yeah, this is a. But, but th this actually is really, really positive. So you believe that as selfish as these people are, that selfishness is going to start to turn to the direction of, hey, man, you know, my restaurant people aren't around and my cleaners aren't around and the garbage people aren't doing their job and the mailman hasn't come by and, you know, all that kind of stuff. They're going to start to the Nancy Pelosi's and the people like that who are used to having this kind of um, uh service oriented um, society are going to start to notice this before it starts to go back. Cause she's a big proponent, you know, the big, Oh, 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 oh look, look, Michelle, what, what did Nancy Pelosi do during the middle of the lockdowns? No mask, but <laughs> right. got her hair, got her she hair went and got her hair done, right? <laughs> yeah. What happens when there's no, there's no chick that's willing to cut her hair. That's right. Okay. <laughs> so that, this, you know, that's the right. thing is that there's, there are a handful of people out there that have more money than God and they don't care. Uh, Jeff Bezos is taking delivery on, on uh, something like a 400 foot long yacht. Okay. Which is basically he's, he's got another yacht in the yacht as a tender because he's got to have another yacht so he can go to, you know, cause the 400 footer will not fit in oh. some of the places he might want to go. So what? he's got to have a 45 or a 50 footer yacht in the 400 in foot the yacht. yacht. Yeah. All right. There are people like that in this world, but they are very few in number. The average person who is even fabulously wealthy is not in that situation. The average congressperson, the average legislator, the average mayor may have more money than you do by a lot. Okay. May have more money than I do by a lot, but they're not Jeff Bezos and they don't have Bill Gates money. <laughs> and the reality is, is that they are absolutely dependent on somebody coming and cutting their grass. 
which is great news for all of us. They are absolutely dependent upon the same society that we are dependent upon. No, 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 yeah, well, and not only that, while people like Bezos can actually maintain a lifestyle where they have reasonable security, the reality of it for your average politician, your average so-called scion of industry, your pharmaceutical executive, your hospital director, your doctor, your whatever. Nope. If, if things really go down the toilet bad, they die just as easily as you and I do walking down the street and because none of them have that kind of security and none of them will engage in the lifestyle necessary, nor do they have the money to pay for it. This is actually extremely good news. This has been an amazing interview. We're going to have to keep coming back to this because, like I said, over the next year to two years is really going to tell the tale because we've already started this spiral. So it's going to be very interesting who and what to watch, who steps up to stop it and make it a very active public conversation. Carl, please tell everyone where to find your book and your website. Well, the, the book can be found off market-ticker.org. It's on the right-hand side bar. You click there and it'll take you all different places you can buy it. Um, it was published about 10 years ago now. And uh, it, it's, I, I would probably write a few things differently, but it's surprising going back and reading it now. It, it, yeah, okay. I, I still don't have a lot I could argue with. Uh, and then there is a second section on the market ticker, market-ticker.org slash NAD, which is no ad, um, or you can construe it some other way if you want. And that has articles that have no sponsorship on them uh, because sometimes I write about things that uh, people would not like to sponsor. And so my opinion uh, runs the gamut from economics to, uh, to politics and sometimes into areas that uh, the powers that be think are things we shouldn't be discussing. Yeah, you have some fascinating stuff, which is turning out to be a lot of topics at the powers and be. There's there's a lot of things that are going to start to shift here because it goes both directions, whether you're a Republican, like I said, Democrat, Libertarian, Green, whoever you are, you're being censored by somebody. And whoever you are, you need society to work. So this UBI notion may sound great until we start to see the impact of it. So this is going to be a really interesting time in history, don't you think? Yeah, I think so. You know, the Depression shaped a generation of people. My, uh, my parents both grew up during that time and came through that. Um, and it, it had a profound impact on them all the way to their death. I, this, this set of circumstances here over the last 10, 15, 20 years, and probably through the next two or three, because I see the backlash already starting, is likely to have the same sort of profound impact on people going forward. I, I think that the, the downstream effects of this are probably going to go on for the next 50 years. Really? Yeah. You think it's going to have a major impact? So, yeah. It's, it's, going to sh- it's going to shift public perception, and, mm. and, and to some extent, it already has. The, uh, it, it, there's, the problem with losing credibility among public agencies is that it's almost impossible to get it back. What happened during the Depression, I had, I had a family member of mine, um, remote family, cousins, that had the revenuers show up at their orchard and burn the trees during the Agricultural Adjustment Act, which is one of FDR's things. And to the day they died, they had a double barrel, you know, 1930s style, double barrel shotgun propped up at the door, loaded. And when I was a boy, when I first met these folks, I was like, why you got that? (laughs) Okay. And the answer I was given was, if I ever see them revenuers again, they're getting them both right between the eyes. That was 50 years later. Wow. It's PTSD almost. It's like what happens it's, through you, through your life shapes who you are. People who have never had anything happen to them, you can tell. It's like, what's wrong with you? What are you so afraid of? It's like. <laughs> once you shift perspectives, they tend to stick. Exactly. Thank you so much 
for coming on this show today. We're going to have you back very soon. This is going to be so exciting, Carl, this whole. You bet. I'm looking forward to tell you. (laughs) I know you are. (laughs) Thank you very much. (laughs) Mr. Carl Deniger of market-ticker.org for the industry experts panel. I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. 